attendees are in listen-only mode. So good morning, good afternoon everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is Lauren Wenzel. I'm at the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and we host this monthly MPA webinar series, sometimes more frequently than monthly, along with our partners, EBM Tools Network and Open Channels. So thanks everybody. And we're really pleased today to welcome Lou Botsford, who's going to be talking about adaptive management of MPAs, predicting responses to MPA implementation for comparison to monitoring data. And he's going to be presenting information from the California Marine Life Protection Act implementation and monitoring and some of the research that's going on to support that. Um, and that some of that research is being supported by California Sea Grant. So we did want to take a moment to give a shout out to Sea Grant, who is turning 50 uh, just this year. Sea Grant was established in 1966 by President Lyndon Johnson, who signed the Sea Grant College and Programs Act. And, uh, Today, the Sea Grant College Program is a network of 33 programs at top universities in every coastal and Great Lakes state, uh, just doing terrific work. So we're really happy to be able to feature that today. And I uh, want to thank Lou Botsford for being here with us. Uh, he is a distinguished professor from the Department of Fish, Wildlife, Fish, and Conservation Biology at the University of California in Davis. Uh, he received his BS from the University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD from the University of California, Davis. A, uh, died in the wool Californian. And he uh, teaches courses in population dynamics, population estimate, and marine conservation science, and has worked uh, on the science advisory team for the implementation of California's Marine Life Protection Act, and also has served on the scientific and statistical committee for the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. So I'm um, really pleased that you can be here. I will just explain, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar, we really encourage you to write in your questions. Lou is going to give the presentation, and then we are going to have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So you don't need to wait till the end to start writing in your questions. And, and we, when we get to the end of the presentation, we will have time to, to have that discussion. So I encourage you to think about any questions you may have. And now I'm really happy to turn it over to you, Lou. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the National MPA Center and the other sponsors for inviting me. Um, so uh, as the first slide shows there, I'm going to be talking about adaptive management of MPAs or the development of the science underlying that. This is work supported by the California Sea Grant. So I'm mainly going to be talking about predicting responses to MPA uh, implementation so we can compare those to monitoring data um, in keeping with adaptive management. And these are my collaborators. Um, obviously, something like this is a team effort. And, uh, and one of the great things about um, this MPA effort in California is you, uh, it's easy to get uh, people to uh, uh, pitch in and help out on projects. So we do a lot of collaborating here. And some of these will be. Uh, listening in some of these collaborators and so if I get a question that I can't answer we might have to uh, defer to one of them. Okay, this is all done in the context of California's new MPAs uh, that were mandated by our Marine Life Protection Act passed in 1999 and we spent uh, subsequent years um, on their implementation. Um, we uh, in 2003, we had only these tiny little red areas as MPAs. Um, then since the uh, MLPA has been implemented, we have many more uh, covering much more area. Um, these were um, implemented first in a Channel Islands process, then in separate processes uh, corresponding to these different colors. Um, of the coastline as you go further north, ended up with 16% of uh, coastline in MPAs. So um, the first question in everybody's mind is, will the new MPAs meet their goals? MPAs have been implemented all over the world, as you can see here, um, and people have asked that a similar question through various meta-analyses. They usually uh, analyze the uh, or quantify the um, these four variables, biomass, density, size of individual fish, and species, species richness. 
um, and they um, compare the uh, the value of this uh, uh, each variable inside MPAs versus the valuable the the uh, variable outside MPAs. So, and you can see from the blue circles that these uh, MPAs throughout the world and these analyses are predominantly uh, successful, um, but there are the red circles um, which uh, indicate uh, MPAs in which uh, there is a lower value inside the MPAs. So what we want to do is avoid uh, having uh, any MPAs of that nature. Uh, um, the words adaptive management uh, re, uh, have many different interpretations, but I so I want to just go over the uh, real definition uh, as handed down by Carl Walters. Um, so, uh, oh, and, and another comment uh, to uh, minimize uh, ba bandwidth, the size of this. Um, I was encouraged uh, not to have much animation, so I've done this without animation. So I'll try to, to instead of using animation, I'll try to lead you through things uh, with my cursor, so you can follow that. So for uh, resource management, uh, usually go, uh, problems usually go through a um, decision process for their solution, and there may be a number of proposals. For our case, this was proposals of various net, net, networks of MPAs, and then we used models to predict uh, what their performance was going to be, the pros and cons of each one. Um, and then the decision makers chose one of these, say proposal number two. Um, and uh, up until the time of, or the advent of adaptive management, this kind of process often stopped right there. But uh, what the adaptive management added to this was that it was a good idea to continue monitoring um, and, um, and seeing how things responded, how the system responded to your uh, change in management. So in our case, it's sampling abundance, biomass, age structure, um, fishery yield. Then the results of those are then compared to the predicted performance from uh, the models of that proposal and uh, the differences between that and what we see in the sampling are then fed back into the decision-making process uh, to uh, fine-tune the um, our either fine-tune the design of the MPAs or fine-tune our understanding. So uh, in a continuous process of what's called adaptive learning. So I'm going to um, talk about four different topics um, regarding what to expect from NPA monitoring. The first is a description of the initial increase in abundance and that results from the filling in of the age structure. Um, that will tell us that uh, knowing the, the uh, uh, level of fishing is very important. So the second topic is estimating local fishing mortality rate. Um, the third topic is a study of when and where to sample to get the most contrast, the best chance of detecting um, uh, differences, and then the last is on the effects of uncertainty and variability. So um, I just want to uh, show uh, that, some, the, that we had done substantial modeling in the implementation process, and we were looking at the long-term abundance distributions and use those in decision making. So this is just an example of the kind of modeling that we did. Uh, and it's uh, a distribution of biomass along a coastline with north being uh, upward and to, to the left. The top two are for red abalone, uh, sessile species, and the bottom one for black rockfish, a highly mobile species. And uh, you can see the difference in both cases between no action and this proposal EXB. So if we enlarge this MPA, um, you can see that um, there's an increase in biomass uh, for abalone inside the MPA for this uh, rather sessile species, but not outside. Um, on the other hand, for black rockfish, you can see that if we um, in that inputting or implementing that MPA um, 
uh, provides higher biomass extending beyond the boundaries of the NPA because it's a, a highly mobile species with a substantial um, larval dispersal. So the, uh, one of the reasons I show you that is that while we spent a lot of effort developing those models, we really couldn't use them for uh, the monitoring. Um, and so for adaptive management, we need to predict the expected near-term responses rather than the long-term responses. So we had to develop uh, what is, is essentially new um, solutions to these same models. So we began with uh, answering the question, what happens when fishing is removed from a fish population? And that the, what, what happens is, is illustrated here. <clears throat> this is a picture of age structure of a fish population in an MPA, where the MPA is implemented at time t equals zero. The grays are abundance, and these uh, different color size or age distributions uh, go from red, which is the fished age distribution, to the unfished. And um, this is essentially um, reversing the truncation that's caused by fishing. Um, people are, most people are fairly familiar with this age truncation of fishing. And this is description, what this part of the modeling is just describing how's that, how that happens. So you can see as we go uh, forward in time, you have more and more uh, age classes growing into the uh, fishable size, uh, fishable uh, ages in, in the population. So um, the question was, how, do, how rapidly does that happen? And the answer was, uh, part of the answer is that it happens um, that the, the uh, ratio of uh, abundance at a certain time to the abundance that you start with uh, goes to uh, a value of m plus f over m, where m uh, and f here are the uh, natural mortality rate and the fishing mortality rate. So that's the ultimate value, and it approaches that at a on a time scale that's set by uh, the natural mortality rate. If you want to see the equation for that, that's in this uh, paper. Um, um, but I'm, I'm not going to show it here. Rather, I'm going to show solutions. So these are solutions for different values of f for a fixed value of m. And the main point here is that you see the most increase in abundance for species that are uh, fish the heaviest. Um, this is a plot uh, so that, that tells us it would be a good idea to know what the fishing mortality rate was if you want to predict what the response is going to be. The uh, other plot here shows um, values, uh, different responses for different values of uh, natural mortality rate um, with uh, the value of F held constant. And the message here is that you're going to see much a greater response for species that are um, long-lived, have a small uh, natural mortality rate. So uh, the other thing that happens here is this, this rate of approach, um, um, asymptotic approach here is determined by um, this uh, natural mortality rate, but that doesn't show up too much in this. So this means that uh, the species that you're dealing with matters, or that the response is going to be different for whether you're dealing with a long-lived or a short-lived uh, species. So the take-home message from that filling-in analysis was that the uh, increase in biomass inside an MPA is going to be uh, greater with higher fishing. So it's important to know the local F. Um, and Sorry, but these th things seem to be hopping around. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, we can get values of F from stock assessments, of course, but most, almost all stock assessments estimate F over a much uh, broader spatial range than we're going to be interested in. Uh, they will go over hundreds or thousands of kilometers, uh, estimate F over that, that range, whereas uh, for MPAs, we want to know things down to a kilometer or 10 kilometer scale. Um, 
the uh, second message is that uh, it would be nice to know what the value of M is because it determines how fast uh, that level is going to be approached. Um, and we, uh, we can sometimes get that out of stock assessments, but even in stock assessments, that's the thing that's really difficult to estimate. Uh, but we'd usually have some sort of sense of how long-lived the species are that we're talking about. And the last take-home message is um, that, that this is the initial effect. This is the initial effect, the first thing that happens. So it's a good thing to be looking at. Other changes, uh, for example, greater recruitment to the fishery and changes in species composition that might depend on um, species interactions in addition to the populations um, being of different sizes. Um, th those things are, will probably take longer. So since we needed that uh, um, estimation of local fishing mortality rate, uh, we developed a, a method for estimating that, and that's described in this paper that was headed up by Will White. Um, and it's in press in ecological applications, but you can get it using this DOI number. And in there, we basically fit an integral projection model, which is a, a kind of a sophisticated, sophisticated size structured model to data in size bins to estimate two things. One is the value of S, and the other was, is the uh, value of recruitment. So this shows the the model that we're using in this continuous line and what the data might look like for several um, values of F uh, ranging from 0 up to 0.1, which is a, a common value for fishing rather long live species. And one of the interesting things about this is that there's really not that much difference between the size distributions as we go over this range. Um, I don't know if you would pick that difference out uh, just looking at these things by eye, but um, the estimation method does a really good job at it. So here are some of the results. It's a Bayesian uh, estimation method, so we can look at posteriors. Uh, these are for uh, blue rockfish and gopher rockfish at Point Lobos. And uh, the, the um, points are, uh, posteriors are clustered right around um, point two, um, and th that can uh, for blue rockfish, and that can be compared to the prior, which we took from the stock assessment, the estimate of F over a much broader range, and it's um, important to realize that this is a value of something like twice that. The estimate is twice what you would get from the stock assessment that uh, gives you a value uh, over a much larger range. So that, that, that uh, indicates that it's important to do this local estimation. Um, again, and this is rockfish, same thing, a um, little broader uh, distribution of, of posteriors. Um, and again, different from what the prior was taken from the stock assessment. So the take home message from the new estimation method is that we have the ability to estimate local fishing rate from size abundance survey data. Um, and uh, moreover, that we can estimate uh, the process error, that is noise and recruitment, and the measurement error uh, separately. Um, and the measurement error would be the error in abundant, estimating abundance. Um, the reason we can do that is because uh, Will formulated this in a state space um, manner um, uh, that, uh, that allows you to estimate these things uh, separately rather than having them be confounded. The next study was headed up by a um, student of mine, Liz Moffat, or former student of mine now, Liz Moffat, and what she did was uh, calculate and plot the uh, uh, density of individuals as a function of distance from um, the uh, MPA, which is shown gray here, um, as, as time went on. And she did this for a bunch of different uh, values of uh, widths of MPAs, 
um, larval dispersal distances, um, uh, home ranges, um, and then what we tried to do, or what she tried to do, was uh, to come up with some kind of general um, rules of thumb that could be used in uh, deciding where to take the sample. And you can see here, time goes from the blue uh, up to uh, red. So we can see that there's equal abundance everywhere at time zero, and then as time goes on, uh, this population uh, continues to decline uh, away from the MPA, uh, but does not decline as much inside the MPA, and that there is the greatest, so there's the greatest, or you, if you move at least two distant units, distance units away, then you'll um, be seeing uh, most of the of the difference, um, and you can't can't really pick this out here, but um, it's best as as we were told by the, the previous model, to wait uh, something like two generation times. So the conclusions there were that the, uh, the we'd see the largest effects, boy, I'm sorry, uh, we see the largest effects um, by uh, sampling uh, two home range distances, or in some cases it was also two uh, larval dispersal distances from the edge after two generations. So this is a, a, a good general, a valuable generalization to use as a rule of thumb, but if you're really interested in doing this, I recommend going to the paper and looking at all the examples. Another important point was that you need uh, before, after comparisons, because if you rely only on inside, outside comparisons, like the meta-analysis I just showed you, uh, you may fail to detect declines in abundance. For example, um, a, an ab abundance may be hot greater inside the MPA than outside the MPA, but they both may be both uh, declining to uh, uh, zero, even, the, even though the MPA is, um, is working. So the uh, last uh, topic area is the effects of uncertainty and variability. And here I just want to show a cartoon version of what the problem is. Um, these are plots of, in blue, uh, fi uh, population that's fished at a rate of um, F equals uh, 0.1, and a green population that was fished at a rate of F equals 0.1, uh, but then that was removed at time zero. <coughs> and this is sort of the time scale that we're looking at right now. We're uh, seven years out, or maybe a few more years, our data go to seven years. Um, and so, you know, it's really difficult to separate whether we have uh, an MPA that's growing as F equals zero or a fish population. Um, and this, uh, the plot on the right um, shows what's happening beyond this time period. With this, this plot is the time um, circled in the red square here. Um, and so you can see to really start making decisions about whether or not you have something different happening in, uh, in, your, in your MPA that that is, it's behaving differently than uh, if it were continuing to be fish. Um, you need to it, to know at least, you, or need to have at least 15 years, or maybe even 20, 25 years here uh, in this example. So that's just an illustration of what the problem is. I'm going to go into uh, actual examples um, now. So we're going to look at. Um, several different locations. One is Point Lobos, just south of Monterey Bay here, um, and then a bit further south, a location called Big Creek, and then further south, um, a location called uh, White Rock. And we're going to be um, um, uh, predicting uh, the responses that we'd expecting be expected to see, and we're going to be comparing those to PISCO samples taken from diver surveys, and that's uh, run by um, and our collaborator, uh, Mark Carr, and his group at UC Santa Cruz. Um, also, we have been uh, in touch with and collaborating with Rick Starr, who's 
um, doing a, a hook and line survey or let a hook and line survey uh, in deeper waters. But I'm going to show the PSCO data for now. Um, so if you, if you look at the uh, comparison, this is for blue rockfish, which is the most ex uh, abundant species. If you compare the abundance inside and outside um, at Point Lobos um, and the size, which you should also you expect to see an increase in size. So these are, are um, um, inside, inside is in the red and outside is in the blue. So, and the M MLPA MPAs were implemented in 2007. You don't see a dramatic difference yet between uh, what's happening inside and outside. Um, here we're kind of fortunate in having earlier data at this location because there was an exi existing MPA there, um, but even that doesn't show uh, a lot of difference. Um, and the same thing for uh, size. There's not a, uh, a, a dramatic uh, in ch increase in the uh, mean size of individuals. And that same thing um, is true uh, to, uh, to some degree in uh, Big Creek, um, the next location to the south, and also uh, at White Rock. We don't have as much uh, data from White Rock. So that was uh, kind of a concern, and so we started looking at this uh, more closely. Um, so we got the uh, data from Big Creek here plotted, um, and from White Rock, and from Point Lobos, um, in the time uh, since 2007, uh, which is the time when the new MPAs were implemented at these locations. And the, they're, they're obviously not showing a, a, an increase, but uh, looks like they even show a decrease. Um, so we were wondering about why we were, all that was happening. So the first thing we did was estimate F for blue rockfish um, for uh, Point Lobos, and this is the one I've showed you, the, F, the value of F at near um, uh, Point Lobos was 0.19. Um, the next one to the south, the value of F at White Rock was uh, 0.1, and the estimated value at Big Creek was essentially zero, so very, very low fishing mortality rate. And that sort of follows the order uh, in terms of distance from the Monterey port, so it's not surprising, but it also gets closer to uh, another port to the south, so um, I don't know how much we should make of that, but, so, but there are believable results. The next thing we did, or the other thing we did when we were estimating F is we uh, from the size distributions is we estimated recruitment variability. And this is a plot of recruitment variability over the years leading up to the implementation in 2007 at this location. And you can see that um, recruitment in our um, upwelling area uh, is highly variable. We can have very high recruitment. Um, in some years, and then almost zero recruitment in uh, other years, and even within years, there's substantial variability uh, over space. So um, once we had those, we uh, put together uh, our predictions to see what we would expect. And this, these predictions include the effect of fishing mortality rate and have added in uh, recruitment variability. Darn. Uh, every time I move my mouse, uh, uh, this changes. Anyway, um, so you, uh, looking at the solid lines, which are just the effects of um, fishing mortality rate on the de deterministic model. So it's uh, a comparison. It, the red line um, is uh, the in, in MPAs, um, and the blue line is uh, continuing to be fished. Um, and so the, the the lines are on top of each other in Big Creek, uh, but on the other hand, in Point Lobos, you can see the, mo the probably the most potential so for um, uh, 
being able to observe a dis, uh, difference. And uh, white rock is somewhere in between. The dashed lines are the uh, stochastic case in which we added recruitment variability. And the clouds here, the pink cloud and the blue cloud, are the 5% uh, to 95% um, probabilities. So we can see that somewhere out in here there would be a good chance or, or that we're going to have to, well, put it this way, that we're uh, trying to differentiate between these things at, at uh, five years is, is probably never a great idea, but um, um, so we're going to have, have to be looking at something uh, 15 to uh, 10 to 15, 20 years. From, with this much um, in there, of course, uh, the next thing we, th there's more to the story, um, the next thing that we looked at was um, starting from an, an ex initial uh, uh, a abundances, um, assuming a stable age distribution, and that wasn't really, that, that changed things a bit, wasn't really very helpful. What really uh, um, gave us um, uh, the best uh, estimate of uh, what, was, what was actually going on, uh, and as reflected in the data, was uh, using the actual initial age distribution. So um, as I pointed out earlier, there had been several years of really low recruitment. So uh, when we, uh, and, and those will show up, of course, in later age and size distributions. So when we included um, our, at this point, say, our observation of what that size distribution looked like and started our simulations from there instead of um, just assuming a stable age distribution, um, we, we got something that looked uh, much more like the data. And so we, we think that we're, uh, this, is, this is a pretty good predict, prediction. And um, that's as far as we've gone so far. Um, we're going to, uh, we're, we're continuing to work on this. Uh, uh, the characteristic of this decision-making um, uh, process uh, as time goes on. But for now, um, we're um, not at a point where we can say clearly that there is a, um, a difference, but the, uh, we look forward to being able to do that in the future. So in summary, for the conclusions for adaptive management, are that the earliest response you're going to see is this increase in abundance uh, to M plus F over M after about 2 over M years. Um, we're able now to estimate the local fishing mortality rate. Um, we can, uh, it, it, it's, it's a good idea to um, include before after comparisons. So you've got to be following things through time basically, which which is uh, what we were doing in the in the examples that I that I showed you. Um, so um, and do this and monitor two home range distances from the MPA, or um, something like um, two uh, larval dispersal distances, um, and see that paper for uh, other com uh, uh, the, the real combinations. Um, and then. The, uh, the next point is that the effect of recruitment variability and measurement error, as I've shown, uh, can really increase the time to detection. Uh, and last point that, that we made was that the effects of initial age and size structure are going to be important and uh, interfere with the ability to make a decision. Um, so where our next steps are to follow up some on this decision-making process, continue to work on that, um, and uh, begin the organization evaluation of other California data. We're just starting uh, a project in collaboration with the uh, California Deficient Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, where we're going to be uh, working on these next three bullets. Um, uh, the evaluation of California monitoring data, uh, methods for integrating MPA and fishery management, and uh, analysis of ROV data. Um, we also want to, while we're doing that, we'll be expanding our uh, analyses 
which uh, for the um, monitoring so far have been pretty much focused on what happens in a single MPA um, and um, enlarge that to the most, uh, expand that to the compli more complicated case of uh, multiple NPAs. And we also have an uh, analysis going on of uh, uh, what, what the effects that uncertainty has on uh, tornado plots, the plots that you sometimes see um, analyses of um, MPAs. So um, that's it. Thanks for listening. Um, uh, uh, we do marine resource science, even though we're at the Ag School here at UC Davis. And uh, I thank you for listening. Glad to answer questions. Okay, thanks very much, Lou. We do have a few questions, so I go ahead and, and encourage uh, listeners to go ahead and send in their questions, and we'll start with the ones that have come in. So we have a question from Nicola Clark who says, thanks, great for the presentation. I was wondering if you could talk about your findings and whether they would be applicable or not to high seas or open ocean MPAs as opposed to coastal MPAs. Um, there, if, if you had the data and uh, you were asking the same questions, yeah, there's, there's nothing that makes this, that ties this to um, being near the coast, um, and, you know, other than the fact that on the high seas and where, you, where you're talking about protecting, you know, migratory species, um, you, uh, you know, that, that's that's a, a, a kind of a different kind of problem because um, there the uh, the home range size is going to be very large. So um, if if you had species that were not moving very, around very much, um, you know, this would apply, but uh, that may not be the case in the large open ocean MPAs. Okay, and here's a question from Michael Park who asks, am I correct in interpreting the results you've presented as showing that MPAs are only effective for long-lived species, like longer than 10 to 20 years? No, no. Uh, we happen to be using we happen to be uh, using long-lived species in our example because uh, we have so many rockfish um, that that are in the sampling. But um, uh, actually, uh, well, you see you see a uh, a greater response um, in the filling in, um, but that doesn't mean that. Um, there would be only responses. It, it, that means that in that aspect of it would be easier to detect, but it doesn't mean that um, that that there's that there's no response for other species. Okay. Um, so here's a question from Todd Stevenson, who who is commenting that. Um, Adapting MPAs to new information is challenging because adjusting the boundaries in any direction often requires intense consultation with numerous stakeholders. Do you know how people in California are planning to deal with these social and political di dimensions if new information becomes available that suggests the boundaries require adjustment? No, not my department. <laughs> <laughs> of course, very important, but um, uh, we're uh, not even close to that, but um, in California, I don't know how much history, his, you know about the history of the MLPA process, but um, it began with a train wreck. So we're very sensitive to uh, having a, um, a transparent decision-making process. Well, the other part of Todd's question is that you mentioned the need to, to obtain before-after data, not just inside-outside data. Are BACI designs still viewed as the gold standard for MPA monitoring? And if so, why aren't they used more? I don't. I don't. I can't. Um, I don't know why other people do what they do. So um, I, I just think we, it, we need a social scientist. Yeah. Right. Uh, to, yeah, figure that out. Um, so, uh, you, you uh, are, um, if you're not keeping track of what's going on over time, then as I said, um, even though you have 
greater density within the MPA than outside, they may both be declining to uh, to a low level. In other words, an MPA may be working but not preventing. Fishing outside may be so, so uh, high that you're not able to prevent uh, ultimate decline of the population. Right. This is the so cumulative impact. Of... And they, they change the way they right. do that. <laughs> Uh, so here's a question from Cindy Dawson who asks, did you run the analysis removing the young of year altogether? Removing the young of year altogether. Okay, when we showed abundances, we were showing abundance of fish, fished, um, uh, sizes, so we weren't including young of year. Um, uh, if you're talking about variability and re recruitment, um, we, we, it, in the last step, we accounted for that um, by starting our simulations with the, the sampled initial uh, age or size structure. Um, Lou, just to so, clarify, she, Cindy said she was talking about removing the counts of young of year from the transects. Um, For abundance. Re, re, removing the count of young, young of year from the transects? Um, well, it, in the transects, we're, we're only looking at um, uh, individuals greater than uh, a certain size, so I, um, I, I, I don't know whether Carrie Nichols does that in our analysis or Will White does it or uh, whether that it comes that way from Mark's group. I don't, I don't really know that, so one of those people might comment, but, but we're not using Young of Year, so. Okay, and I would just add too that all of these questions are being captured, so we can follow up more uh, extensively offline if there's, you know, one of the partners oh, yeah. or authors. Yeah, on this I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to do that. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question from Charlie Wally. He's asking, do you think... Charlie Wally? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, good. To toss it right out. Um, do you think that the impacts of climate change may affect recruitment variability so much that these models become unwieldy to use? Um, um, and that could happen. I, I, I really uh, don't know. You know, species are likely to be shifting. I mean, they, we've demonstrated that they're shifting. Um, so I, I really, you know, uh, that those those kinds of predictions uh, I do when I'm wearing my other hat. But um, I, I haven't really worked very much on the how much things are going to, the, the quantitative consequences of how much things are going to change over space. But it's certainly uh, going to be a problem. We just, um, I haven't done anything on that. What, one, one effect of uh, climate change that I, which is completely different, um, is that uh, having to adapt to climate change has really confused um, the definition or the perceived definition of adaptive management. So when you tell people you're working on adaptive management now, they automatically think you're working on uh, the effects of adapting to the effects of climate change. So it's a bit of confusion. Uh, that's an interesting point because I think you're right about that. Uh, the climate folks have kind of taken over that term and uh, I think what you're saying is that term has a a long history and use before it came into the climate world. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Even even uh, Charlie Wally is confusing though. We I remember we were, we had I think we were talking to to someone who um, was completely unfamiliar with our science, um, and we asked them if they understood everything. And they said, "Yes, I do." But what's a Charlie Wally? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to remember that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I presume he's interesting. So I mean, he's. He, I assume he's listening. So. He is listening. Yeah, I'm sure you'll hear from him. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um, here's a question from Cynthia Catton, who's who asks, "Do you have plans to do similar analyses for shellfish species that are more sessile and have um, 
size, not age structure, to inform the model? Uh, yes, um, and uh, everything we're we're doing now uh, is is essentially done uh, in size structure, where we have to be um, inputting data because uh, it's you know although we go through the process of aging fish and stock assessments, I think it's it would be much too expensive to try to do that in the management of MPAs. Um, so we have included uh, sea urchins. Um, sea urchins and abalone um, were in most of our uh, analyses that, that we've done um, in the past. And I, I presume they're going to be monitored um, and they will be in our uh, future analysis of monitoring. OK. Uh, you know, there's a, we had a question already kind of related to this, and I see that there are a couple of more. So there's obviously a lot of interest in the question about what kinds of decisions could this science lead to, or what kinds of changes in the management uh, could this science lead to? And do you have any insight about that? Not necessarily how it would be done in terms of stakeholder engagement, but just what, what sorts of, um, of changes managers might make based on the kinds of things you're seeing. Um. So let's see. I I I actually don't know. I mean, I I um uh don't really uh think of myself as figuring out what managers should do. I I think of myself as uh, if a manager tells me he wants to know the consequences of doing a certain thing, then I tell him what I think will happen. So um, it's just that, that's so again, not my department. Sorry. That's all right. Um, and here's, you mentioned it in your uh, closing slide, uh, the idea of, of uh, the impacts of multiple MBAs, MPAs, and we do have a question from Becky Oda who's asking, given that the MPA network was designed to function as a network, would the application of estimating abundance in individuals be helpful in assessing fish populations throughout the network? So basically, um, how does looking at this as a network perhaps change or influence some of the conclusions you might draw? Okay, well, um, this, uh, this uh, whether or not the thing is, is, is functioning as a, as a network often comes up, and, and uh, that it, uh, it, from a pop population dynamics point of view, um, it does function uh, as a network, and uh, that effect um, is um, included in uh, the modeling that we've done um, the, uh, for the implementation. And that effect, eventually, when I start, start talking about uh, including multiple MPAs, that effect will be included there. Um, sometimes I think people. Um, uh, in, in 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 trying to figure out whether something's uh, operating as a network, I mean it it almost assuredly is, uh, but showing that would be uh, require uh, a, a big experiment uh, to show that 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 there's this network effect. I mean, in, in population dynamics, um, the network effect is uh, in it. Basically, that um, for individual MPAs, populations will persist um, inside an MPA that's roughly um, the size of their larval dispersal distance, um, roughly speaking. So, uh, and that holds up until the point that you've covered a certain fraction of the coastline, um, and that's something like. Uh, in some cases, 35 percent, um, and so the, and, and the fact that the that then a species of any uh, dispersal distance uh, uh, is, will persist. That's what we refer to as the network, network effect or network persistence, um, and and that definitely happens. But it would be difficult to show that experimentally. So I I always discourage people from um, uh, uh, thinking about it, or spending too much time on that question, <laughs> but uh, nobody with nobody agrees with me on that. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, here's another network-related question you can oh, good. kick around or, or kick to the side if you want. Um, understanding that we may need 15 or more years to understand the true impacts of MPAs on populations of marine species, what, if anything, can we say at this point about California's MPA network and its impact on the health of California marine life? Um. Uh, Asking for that big can, picture take-home point, I think. Yeah, yeah, we can say that um, there has uh, that we haven't demonstrated um, that these uh, uh, things in you know, using using the data that I talked about, we haven't been able to demonstrate um, a positive effect. But what we have demonstrated is that it's too soon, you know. And this is backed up with data. It's too soon to. Uh, to be able to detect that, so um, it's definitely there. Are definitely, scientific reasons for uh, waiting to see uh, for, before you make the final decision. And you, Lou, you do might, you know if work like this is happening elsewhere in the state, or is this the first work of its kind happening in California? Um, modeling for I think I, I don't know of anyone else doing modeling for. Um, the interpretation of uh, of monitoring data that is looking at the transient responses, especially not to the degree that that we are. So I I don't know. Uh, there's certainly other were other people modeling MPAs in the decision making uh, process. There was a, a group at uh, Santa Barbara. Okay. Um, but if 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 I'm wrong, please, uh, uh, whoever's doing it, please contact me. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a, a question from uh, Southern California. In Orange County, we are finding a lack of funding or a clear funding strategy for monitoring and managing MPAs. Is there anyone doing research on how to fund this kind of work? The state has made it clear that they view this as a cost locals need to figure out. Do you have any insight into yeah, this? Well, um, Here's a quote from me. <laughs> if you're not going to do the monitoring, you might as well not just do the MPAs. Forget about it, <laughs> because uh, you know that these uh, it's a potentially valuable tool, uh, but we won't know how valuable it is uh, unless we uh, monitor the effects. So uh, I encourage people all over the world to you know if they're going to put in an MPA and then you know, take this management step. Then they should uh, demonstrate, you know, just as, as a matter of public uh, policy regarding transparency, uh, demonstrate somewhere that uh, really has a pos They really have a positive effect. Okay, and, and I know that there is some work going on in terms of uh, continuing to provide implementation support. Uh, or at least strategizing about how to provide long-term implementation support in California. So uh, maybe someone can can chime in on that, or um, or we can talk about that offline if if others know more about that. Yeah, but one of the one of the goals of our our new uh, collaboration with uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, including including Becky Oda, by the way, um, is that uh, we'll have. Uh, Maybe a better organized or additional organization uh, injected into the monitoring process, and, and know a little bit in a couple years, uh, a little bit more about um, how we should be uh, monitoring. And, and I do want to say that Cindy Dawson has added that we do have 2.5 million annually, and have just secured up to 5.4 million from the Ocean OTC. Um, Someone from California right. is going to have to help yeah, me out. I good, don't know what OTC good. is. Yeah, not my department. That's her department. Yes, <laughs> once through cooling. Um, okay, so so there is work going on to pull together um, monitoring, but of course this is a challenge. It is a big network and it has a lot of monitoring needs, and I yeah. know that uh, that is a big challenge. Yeah, I I, tr I tried to confine myself to uh, the results of our research. Um, rather than giving a status report on uh, California MPAs. And I will also just mention that uh, 
that Cindy also uh, notes that there is a state management program that is funding postdocs to tackle the issue of designing a science-informed long-term monitoring plan. So that work is going on. And uh, I'm sure that, um, I know Cindy has, has given some talks for the MPA Center before, but it sounds like there may be some interest in this, so maybe we can uh, find a way to get some of this yeah, information yeah. out more broadly. Th that, that's the collaboration that I was talking about. Um, she arranged for us to have three postdocs funded who will be working on this over the next um, 18 months. So um, we're, uh, and, and it's, it's a uh, collaboration with the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So we're really excited about this um, and the potential for making progress. Okay, so and here's a here's a different perspective from the state of Hawaii from Darla White. She says here in Hawaii we are formalizing the monitoring program within the managing agency because there is so much difficulty with long-term funding. The only way to really get long-term data important to the state is to take it over. Is there any other way that the state can partner with other groups to get the monitoring going until the state can initiate some sort of program? So I think what we're hearing here is that there's this tremendous need for a sort of dedicated long-term monitoring effort that involves yes. mul multiple partners that can come to the table. And it sounds like California is, is putting that together and other states are also really interested in that. Yes, and, and I encourage uh, monitoring. Um, you know, we, uh, in, in uh, the, the typical management of fisheries, we spend a lot of time on monitoring, a lot of, lot of money on monitoring, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be spending that same amount on uh, monitoring MPAs. And we do have someone who's mentioning that if anyone is interested, they can go to California Department of Fish and Games 2016 Master Plan for MPAs, which has some good information about how the state plans to manage the MPA network going forward. And that is on the um, California Department of Fish and Games website. So you could just Google 2016 Master Plan California MPAs, and you should be able to find that. And Cindy also just wants to let folks know that 16 million has been invested in baseline monitoring at the time of implementation. So there has been a considerable investment that's been made in monitoring, and it's, uh, it's now a question of continuing that and ma making sure that it's ongoing. Yes. I, think, I think what we're hearing from the state folks on this webinar, uh, again, is that the state is, is definitely committed to the monitoring of the MPAs and to ensure yes. that that continues. Yes, we're, we're extremely excited about the, uh, starting to do this uh, on more of a statewide basis. So, um, so maybe I, I could give a webinar in, in 18 months. <laughs> we will call you back and, uh, and ask you how things are going. And I, I think, yeah. um, you know, what, and, and what I wanted, the, go ahead. I want to thank Cindy and uh, Becky for chiming in. They're my collaborators on this. I think one of the, the big take-home messages from this webinar is just the crucial importance of MPA monitoring and that it really has to be partnership-based because we have university researchers, we have state agencies, and other partners who all have a vested interest in this and need to understand what's happening and, and how these MPAs are working or are not working as anticipated and, and eventually what that means for their management. So. Um, Lou, I don't know if you want to say any last words as we wrap up here. Um, I'd just like to um, say that, you're, that, that that's a good summary. That, those are, uh, that's the enduring large-scale message is that monitoring is important and uh, we're figuring out how to do it. So, um, um, and I, again, I'd like to thank my collaborators. Obviously, I couldn't do this by, by myself. So All right, and, and I would also like to thank everybody who, uh, obviously I'd like to thank Lou for providing this, this really interesting presentation, and all of the people who wrote in, and also those who, who chimed in on this discussion, uh, and I would just uh, encourage folks to go check out that California Department of Fish and Wildlife website um, for more information, and, and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, and this, this recording will be posted on open channels, so if anybody missed it or wants to go back, um, you will be able to do that on open channels. Thanks. Okay, thank you.